Um, so hello and welcome to today's Digital Lunch and Learn. Today, um, we're here with Dr. Cassandra Berencott, ME07, and she'll be discussing the SD First, SD First program and uh, how it helps first-generation students here at South Dakota School of Mines. And again, my name is Sarah Von I. I'm the Interim Alum Alumni Director here at CARA. And just a few things before we get started. Um, I am recording this, so and afterwards I will get it uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you missed it or would like to share it with anyone, um, it'll be there to access. And you can also access other recordings of our um, digital lunch and learns, our department updates, um, also on our YouTube channel. So if you can um, use a chat function, everyone's always curious who's here. Um, just say hi, uh, please enter your class and major just, just so we can tell. Um, well, to get things started, please welcome Dr. Cassandra Berencott. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Hopefully it's just as nice where you are um, as where we are. So um, appreciate the introduction, and I'm going to have the privilege of talking about our SD First program today. So let me get um, to the right thing and share. Okay. Hopefully I have successfully done it and maybe Sarah, you could tell me if, if yes, I have or no, I have not. Yep, you are good. Looks okay, okay. So, um, I saw my way here. Uh, like Sarah said, I'm gonna be talking about first-generation students and a new program on our campus called the SD First Program. Um, and uh, I don't have, access, but Sarah, maybe you could watch the chat as I'm, as I'm talking here and feel yes. free to interrupt for those of you that are joining us with questions, comments, thoughts. Uh, we'll just make this a discussion as we go. So don't feel like you have to hold thoughts and questions till the end, certainly. Um, okay, so with that, let me get started. The first thing I want to talk about is what is first generation, because uh, we're going to talk about this term a lot, and it's it has a bunch of different uh, meanings depending on on where your definition comes from. Uh, for this uh, work that we're doing and what we're going to be talking about today, we use the Department of Education's uh, definition, which is students that <clears throat> have parents, <clears throat> excuse me, who have never earned a bachelor's degree. So these. These students might have parents that have associate's degrees or their parents have some college experience, but they have not earned a bachelor's degree. And um, in, in terms of this population of students, it's actually a, a big population in that there are more than 25% of all US undergrads have first generation status. Um, if all high school students were to go to college, 62% of them would be first generation. Uh, so there's a, a big untapped potential there. Um, unfortunately, they do tend to enroll in college at a much lower rate than their non-first generation counterparts. And so that's 72 versus 93% enrollment in college. Um, just demographics of this group, they tend to be more diverse in age, their background, their socio socioeconomic status, ethnicity. They're more likely to stay close to home and that makes them less likely to live on campus as well. Um, and one of the, the major things here that we'll talk about is they may actually have limited um, family experience with higher education system. So those of you that are joining that have been through the higher education system or maybe have kids that have gone through recently, it's a pretty complicated process. And if you've ever filled out a FAFSA, for example, that can be a pretty complex uh, process that if you have no experience might be a little bit daunting. And so those are some of the things that we're gonna, gonna try to address with this program. Uh, the graph on the right here just shows, uh, this is national data from 2003 and four, so it's a little bit old, but these are first year students who completed their bachelor's degree within six years, so our six year retention rate nationally. And you can see that, uh, if you can see my pointer here, having um, status of both low income and first generation versus neither of those two things has a pretty huge difference on your graduation rate. And so those are the, the things that we're trying to tackle with this SD First program. So we wanna talk a little bit about what makes first generation students successful or not successful for that matter too um, in, in several different categories. So the first is recruitment. And uh, in terms of recruitment, 
our first generation high school students that are coming to us are, are much less likely to enroll in science and engineering majors than their non first generation counterparts by about twice. And so this affects STEM degrees like we have on our School Minds campus um, more than other degrees, certainly. There's also a, a gap in academic preparation. And so this gap shows up in terms of study time in high school, their GPA in high school, self-confidence, um, and self-confidence in math and writing specifically. Also, in terms of statistics, we have um, the statistic that first-generation students tend to uh, take more remedial math in college, 40% uh, versus 16% for those non-first generation students. And so again, that affects our STEM degrees where if you've been through the School of Minds, we have a, a significant emphasis on math. And so that can be a pretty big hindrance for first generation students as well. Um, first year GPA, we know uh, through other research is a major predictor of future success in college. And um, we actually see that first-generation students earn a lower GPA than non-first-generation students. And this tends to be pretty significant too. The next category that I wanna touch on is campus connections. And this is a, a big piece of our SD First program. And so this is the, the sort of the motivation for it, right? Um, in that groups of students that don't have any support systems, and, and I'm talking about support systems like SWE or athletics or um, international systems where, and, and veterans where all these programs are set up and they have places to go on campus and, and folks that um, kind of help with their, with their guidance, they tend to retain at a much higher rate than the unaffiliated student populations. Um, and so, so getting students involved in um, campus life, getting them involved in um, projects and research and groups on campus is a, is a really big piece for this. The other side is the mentoring and advising that happens on campus. And especially in STEM fields, there's a, a paper out there that looks at um, likelihood of students to be retained by meeting with their academic advisors. And for each meeting with their academic advisor, this actually goes up by 13%, their, their retention. So um, that's a pretty, pretty big one that we're gonna try to uh, emphasize within the program. Um, and then also living on campus and being involved in either academic or social related activities, again, to kind of get that support system going. And we already talked about that first generation students tend to not live on campus. And so um, that can be a, a big hindrance. Finally, I wanna put out some financial considerations for first generation students. Um, and so this data actually comes from a board, South Dakota Board of Regents affordability report where they looked at four-year public universities across all 50 states. Um, from that report, South Dakota actually ranked 20th for highest for in-state in tuition and fees. Uh, that means we're kind of right in the middle, pretty close for in-state tuition and fees. On the other end, unfortunately, we were 50th uh, for highest grant uh, aid. And so we're, our students in South Dakota are not getting much aid is what that means. Um, those two things combined make South Dakota actually eighth highest for average net price. And that's the cost for tuition and fees minus the aid that students are getting. Um, so then kind of dialing down and looking within South Dakota, we have six state institutions in South Dakota, um, four public, four year public universities, six of them. Uh, we actually ranked highest for the average net price uh, at 19,577 per year. So this is in state um, and but fourth highest for grant aid and uh, pretty low on the number for the number of students with Pell Grants, in fact, lowest in the state. Um, couple that with, with all what's going on. And so we're, we're first for highest for in-state uh, price within South Dakota. Um, another big financial piece in, in terms of what first generation students are looking at is most first generation students plan to have a job while they're, while they're going to college. Um, and even on the, South, on the School of Mines campus, a report just a few years ago showed that uh, from, from the freshman responses, 35% of them were uh, intending to work 10 plus hours per week while they were going to school full time. Um, so they've got some financial concerns, certainly. Okay, so let me switch a little bit now that we've kind of talked about the 
the successes and failures and what might happen to first generation students and tell you a little bit about first generation students at the School of Mines. Um, over the last five years, about a third of our incoming freshman class is first, our first generation students. So we have a large population of first generation students on campus. Um, of those, 42% identify as low socioeconomic status. And so that comes from, um, that status is, is boiled down from education, um, income, and occupation. Uh, then of those students, of the low socioeconomic students, we have 80% that are first generation, most of those. Um, a lot are minority students, 18%, a lot of South Dakota res residents and a lot of Rapid City residents. So they, again, they tend to stay close to home. Um, the bad news for first generation students, I'll say bad news, but the, the area that we're gonna try to work on. Students, first generation students tend to persist at a much lower rate than, than non-first generation students. This is nationally and right here on our own campus. So looking at nationally a three-year persistence rate, so students who started and were still in their uh, program three years later and had persisted, first-generation students were at 48%, while non-first-generations were at 67%, so a pretty pretty large gap there. We see a very similar gap at the School of Mines, and now this is based on a five-year graduation rate, but we have 49% campus-wide for a five-year graduation rate versus half of that, 24% for first-generation students. And so this is really where this SD First program is targeted and we'd really like to close that gap um, and help our first-generation students succeed here on the School of Mines campus. This all ties in really well to the um, School of Mines strategic plan. And so you've probably seen this uh, if you're alumni um, been published a lot of different places, but of course our, our mission is to develop world-class leaders in science and engineering to benefit society. We have goals um, to increase undergraduate enrollment, undergraduate retention, um, and the graduation rate uh, by 2023, which is coming up very quickly. Um, and so in order to increase those things, we do have to have um, concerted efforts in, in each of those categories and across the the different categories. So SD First uh, really is hopeful in that we can move the needle on a lot of these different pieces. So let me talk a little bit about STEM itself and the National Science Foundation. So SD First is a program on our School of Mines campus that is funded by NSF, the National Science Foundation. And specifically within NSF, it's in a program um, called STEM, which is Scholarships for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. The goals of STEM are listed here, and it's really to increase the number of students in, in STEM fields around the country, um, specifically the number of low-income students. Uh, promote mechanisms on campuses for uh, leading those students to success and helping them succeed and then understanding how they do and don't succeed. So, so doing some research, some evidence-based research on, along the way. And so that's a little bit about STEM. We have had quite a bit of success with STEM on our campus in the past. Uh, and so um, let me point out two successful STEM grants that we've had in the past. Um, I'll go backwards. So, so Tioche Bay was the first on campus and started in 2008. Um, and it's just finished up this last year and looking um, forward to more success through other means, not through NSF. Um, and so in that program, led by Dr. Carter Kirk, an industrial engineer here on campus, um, that program was seeking to recruit, retain, and graduate American Indian students in STEM degrees um, and had some really wonderful success there. We also had another program that started just shortly after that in 2009 that's still going on um, for a short while longer. This one has been led by Dr. John Keller and, and Dr. Mike West uh, in the metallurgy department here on campus. And this program really focused on scholarship and mentoring um, to help, help women, particularly women, but underrepresented students succeed in engineering. Um, and so those two programs were very successful, have been very successful on campus, and we actually have learned a lot of things, um, we have a lot of lessons learned from each one of these programs. And so it was nice to take a look back and see what was going to work, what might work, what might not work, 
um, in helping make this new program focused on first generation students successful. So the SD first program, it just started in August of this year was our first cohort. Um, and the objectives here are listed, but the hypothesis of the, of the overall program is that first generation students are not really limited by their interests or their aptitude, but by this messy higher education process itself. And I mentioned this earlier in that higher education can be tough to navigate, especially as a freshman, especially if you have um, family that doesn't have experience there as well. And, um, and so that was the hypothesis. And we'd really like to focus on three different areas, academic, social, and financial areas in connecting students to campus and getting them involved and keeping them here in creating a network within their peer groups, faculty, um, and then providing need-based scholarships and the financial piece. And so all of the, the things that I talked about above for the motivation on, on why students succeed or don't succeed, we're really looking through these objectives to, to highlight those. Um, here's kind of an overview of the SD First program itself. Um, and so we're looking um, kind of this, this linear pathway here to recruit students into the program, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute that we've done already. Um, prepare them uh, by training mentor, prepare the mentors and faculty to help these first generation students because there are issues that these mentors, uh, peer mentors and faculty mentors need to address that don't exist with other populations of students. Um, retain and reinforce sort of go together. I'll talk about those together. And so this is being able to connect um, things that are happening on campus in terms of resources for students um, and highlighting those and the importance of students reaching out for those things. Um, and then reinforcing this so that we can keep them and, and um, help them succeed towards their degree, the, the end point here. There's also a reward, of course. So this is a scholarship program and it is a need-based scholarship program. So students have to demonstrate a financial need and will receive a scholarship based on that. And then there's, a, of course, a review process where we have both internal and external program evaluation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our first pieces of, of internal program evaluation um, and external program evaluation is coming soon. Um, and then of course, reinvest. So, the funding from NSF is a uh, five-year funding period. And so we're looking to the future, what happens after that five years, can we figure out a way to keep this program going um, to really promote the success of these STEM students, these first-generation STEM students. So let me introduce our team here a little bit. Uh, first is Alicia Jensen, who is on the call, but I can't, uh, Alicia, I don't, oops, sorry. Alicia, I don't know how to unmute you, but if you're here and you can unmute yourself, say hi. Uh, so Alicia was hired this spring uh, and started this summer and is the SD First program coordinator. So she's doing all of the heavy lifting um, on coordinating the program and helping to mentor students and meeting with them and that kind of thing. Um, myself, John Keller, Mike West, our faculty members on the project uh, in, in mechanical engineering and then materials and metallurgical engineering as well. We also have Lisa Carlson from the Student Success Center, Jesse Herrera from the Center for Inclusion, and Molly Moore um, from Academic Affairs, Office of Provost, um, and Admissions and Financial Aid kind of piece coming in. And so um, this is a really well-rounded team that provides a lot of different um, perspectives on first-generation students and can help connect them with different pieces on campus. Okay, so the first piece here, um, oops, I have a note from Dorothy. Sarah, how do I, do I need to unmute folks? You can unmute her if you go over to allow to talk. She, um, I can't see her note, so. And now it disappeared. Yeah, if you, here, I'll, I'll do it. I'll let her through real quick. Okay. Hi, I'm Dorothy Hartwell and I'm Kimmy94. And I just had a quick question as you went through the people that are on the program. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm a first first um, generation student also, and I was wondering if you need any volunteers for the program. Yes. Because I'm retired. Ahead of me. <laughs> so I'm yeah. looking for, and I, I always come to these, so I'm interested in this one for sure because I'm first degree, and it was a big process to go through and learn everything on my own and and get through the process of getting into School of Mines and everything. So yeah, so you know the hurdles that that these students are yes. facing certainly. Um, so that is on one of my last slides is the how you can help piece. Um, and I definitely would take any help that you would be willing to give. So maybe okay. on to that and see if I answer it at the at the end. And then we can touch base um, and maybe Sarah can help us connect a little bit afterwards. That sounds good. I didn't know when to raise my hand. So no, I appreciate <laughs> Thank you. Good Thanks presentation. So so I wanna talk a little bit about the process that we've been through so far this fall. Um, so the first piece is to recruit students into the program and we have a 2021 cohort. Um, and so this happened uh, starting in the spring where we had a competitive application process that the team I just introduced all reviewed the applications and selected students to be in the program. We have 25 first time freshmen in the program. They are all first generation students and they all have a demonstrated financial need. Um, through the NSF funding, we were able to fund 15 of these students. And then we also had a donor who, uh, Dorothy, like you, has a, a soft spot for first-generation first students specifically. And so we had 10 students that were funded by um, the donor through CARA. And so a big shout out and thank you um, to our donor so that we could up the number of students that are impacted by this program. So that means we have 25 students in the program. We have a distribution across uh, men and women, 14 and men and 11 women, um, hitting a bunch of different majors. Note that students in the, in the program have to be a science or uh, engineering major. Um, we have a couple athletes and one ROTC student, and they are from, a lot of them are from nearby, but we have a couple that are coming to us from farther away, Pennsylvania and Florida, namely. Uh, each one of these students is receiving $5,000 per year for four years. So this is a pretty large scholarship uh, that they're receiving. Now, they, I'll talk a little bit about they do have to do some things um, to keep that scholarship, of course. Um, and it's renewed, reviewed and renewed annually. Uh, and so that's a little bit about our, our cohort. On the mentoring piece, just a, a short note on the mentoring piece. Um, but we do have a really nice network available for our SD First students. And so surrounding those SD First students, we have a peer mentor that is assigned to them. This is another student, a higher level student in their major. Um, and so they're asked to meet with a peer mentor uh, throughout the semester. We also have um, the SD First program coordinator that I mentioned, Alicia Jensen. Um, and so they're meeting with Alicia throughout the semester as well. We have student success advisors for students within the student success um, department. And so, uh, so we have students meeting with those and the, those student success advisors are really good about keeping tabs on how students are doing in class, watching over their grades, um, calling them in when needed. And then each student has an academic advisor in their home department. And so mechanical engineering students are advised specifically by me. Um, et cetera. And so they have somebody to go to within their, their own department to talk about department needs. Um, we would also like to be able to connect students um, to campus activities. And, and that's really to retain and reinforce the importance of being connected on campus and getting involved. Um, one of the biggest things that we see in the literature on, on negative impacts on first generation students is that they're not involved. And so this piece is pretty important um, in connecting them to what's going on on campus and their resources. Uh, we have a website where we've tried to co-locate a lot of this information for students. And it's a kind of a one-stop shop. If they need something, they can go find it there. Um, and then also creating that support network that I talked about through uh, peer mentors, faculty mentors, and all the other campus resources that are available. In order to receive this scholarship and continue to receive this scholarship, one thing that we require students to do is uh, the, the table that you see here. So um, I'll skip down one and, and talk about the meeting with academic advisor and peer mentors. So they're, they're required to meet with those folks one and four times per semester. 
They also have to meet with Alicia three times a semester. Uh, if necessary, they need to be enrolled in math recitation or remedial math. Um, and, and so to kind of bolster that, that math background. And they also are required to attend at least one extracurricular activity per semester. So that might be a professional society meeting such as ASME, or it might be um, rock climbing club, uh, whatever their extracurricular activity of choice is. And that's at least one. And I, I don't think we will have any issue getting our students to do that. There's enough plenty to go around and they're, they're all pretty involved already. Um, going back to the top, we also are gonna have monthly workshops. And um, so once a month, we're gonna get all 25 students together and have some kind of workshop. And this, these are social workshops, um, academic workshops where they're learning something, speakers. Um, and so those kind of things are happening once a month where we get together uh, with our students. So let me kind of show these um, specific events that we've had so far and a couple that are coming up. Uh, again, these can be social, they can be academic, they can be confidence building um, type of workshops. So in August, we had, we actually had two things in August, an orientation, a welcome for students. Um, they were invited with their families during move-in week and just a, a short welcome meeting where they could meet some of the team members, they could meet each other, um, parents could ask questions. We also had an academic advising session in August where one of our team members, Dr. Keller, came in and talked to students about um, some of the ins and outs of academic advising um, before they were required to go meet with their academic advisors, so a little less stigma, hopefully. Um, in September, we did an emotional intelligence workshop, which is coming up in a minute, and so I'll just kind of plug that and say, hang on for the results of that because they're really interesting. Um, in October, just a, a few weeks ago, in fact, we had a blacksmithing event and that was here on campus in the foundry. And those are the pictures that you see here. Um, so students got to go down to the foundry and do some blacksmithing and we made little hooks um, that they could take with them. And this was one of those confidence building uh, workshops specifically. So a lot of students haven't had the chance to do something um, in the shop like this in the past and so it can be a little intimidating and a little overwhelming. And so getting them in a smaller group in this situation and letting them sort of feel out and be a little more confident was really helpful. Um, coming up in November, on November 8th, we're gonna have a uh, First Generation Celebration Day. This is actually a national day, recognized day. And so we're gonna have a speaker for that. And hopefully um, once I get all the details hammered out, uh, we'll be sending that out to, student, to, to those of you that are interested to attend as well. Um, and meet some of our students. In December, we're gonna have a final study support group and uh, coming up in January, something on the financial piece um, that I think Alicia is calling dollars and donuts. Uh, and so having financial aid come and, and talk to students and make sure that they're on the right path for financial aid. <clears throat> so th those are some of the events that we have going on and have done already. Um, we will keep building those in and we'll have them once a month every year for students to attend. So on the scholarship piece, the rewarding piece. Um, so I, I mentioned that these are need-based scholarships and so students have to demonstrate through their FAFSA that they have um, some unmet financial need. Uh, each student is receiving that $5,000 per year for four years should they keep up their, their requirements. Um, and, and we had 15 students in this cohort funded by the National Science Foundation and then a generous donor support another 10 making us um, have those 25 scholars in this first, first year of the program. Um, an interesting piece that I, I pulled out yesterday uh, is that our 25 students that we have selected to be in the program had an average unmet need of almost $15,000 for this academic year. So um, between what they're paying for, um, for tuition, their other grants, any help that they're getting from their family, there's, they still have a huge unmet financial need. And so these are our scholarships that are really needed um, in that respect. Again, in order to, to receive this scholarship, they have to complete a number of things and that's listed on the bottom here. They have to be enrolled at at least half time or more. And so full-time students is, is 12 credits per semester. Uh, so they have to be half time and pursuing a bachelor's of science degree in engineering or, or science, which is easy to do on our campus. 
They have to have that demonstrated unmet financial need through a FAFSA, so they have to submit that with their application. They have to maintain a 2.5 GPA throughout their time in the program, and our, our 10 students that are funded by, by um, our donor actually have a little bit higher requirement of a 3.0 GPA, so kind of two different groups there. And they have to participate in all the programmatic elements, so the workshops um, that we provide and the meetings and all of those things. Okay, so on the review side, this is kind of the interesting newest data. Um, we have been looking at emotional intelligence for our internal reviews. Um, and so emotional intelligence for anybody that, that isn't familiar like I was, this is um, a set of skills, both emotional and social skills that establish how well you perceive and express yourself, um, develop and maintain those social relationships, cope with any challenges along the way, um, and hopefully you can use that emotional information in an effective and meaningful way. So there are five different um, areas that the emotional intelligence survey that we give students measures, um, seen on this, this colorful wheel here. And they go from, um, on the top there, the self-perception to self-expression, interpersonal decision-making and stress management. And so we can actually measure where students are in relationship to um, a peer group for them, so, so nationwide, the, the data collected. Um, and one reason that we're using this emotional intelligence is that uh, it's pretty well known that students who have a higher level of emotional intelligence are linked to things like higher grades, healthier study habits, um, better navigation of their relationships, and long-term can be more successful. And so uh, this is really an interesting instrument. Um, it's called the EQI. And so you'll see that, that used throughout the next few discussion points here. Um, and we've given that to students, uh, like I said, a few months ago already. And so that gives us kind of a baseline and we will be measuring that uh, throughout the program in hopes that we can increase the areas that need to be increased for this particular population to help them be more successful. So this gives us, this baseline is gonna give us um, um, a nice place to start for, for where we need to um, focus our workshops on, focus our, our efforts for our students. So here's some preliminary data. Uh, again, this was just taken this fall with our 25 students, our first cohort. So this is aggregate data for our 25 students. Um, the thing I'll point out is the, the y-axis over here, the vertical axis, has numbers from 85 to 105. Um, and those numbers are a little bit arbitrary, but, but the 100 mark is the, um, is the norm for the group that we're looking at. Uh, and so this is the norm for stu college age students, ages 18 to 22. And so that would be sort of the norm across the country, if, if you'll think about it that way. Down on the bottom, I have all of these uh, small nomenclatures down here that correspond to the graph below. So in red, we have self-perception. Orange is all the self-expression categories. Uh, yellow is interpersonal. Green is decision-making. Blue is stress management categories. And then yellow, this last point here, is the overall well-being, which can be tied to happiness and overall success, but this is not not tested for validity. And so we have to be a little bit careful with this one, but it is kind of another predictor for overall happiness. Um, the next thing I'll point out is that the first data point in each one of these colors is the composite score. So for example, this data point, at what, 94-ish, um, shows us our composite score for self-perception, which includes self-regard, self-actualization, and emotional self-awareness. And so that first one is just the composite score within the category for each of these next three um, categories. So this is the data for our, our first cohort. And a few things that you'll notice um, are the highs and lows, right? And I wanna be careful that these are not good and bad. They are just varied from the norm across the nation. Um, and so overall, we have a slightly lower emotional intelligence. Um, that's for our first generation students. And that's something we hope throughout the course of this program we, will, we can raise. 
Um, in terms of the self-expression, I'll go to the orange category first because it's a little bit lower. Um, one thing to point out is this emotional expression and uh, how low that is. That's probably one of our, our lowest, farthest away from, from the norm. Um, the other one is the interpersonal relationships. So in the yellow, this data point here, IR is relatively low. And then self-regard, um, let's see. Where is self-regarding? Interpersonal relationships. Where did I put that one? Oh, red, sorry. The red one over here is relatively low as well compared to, to norms. Um, and so those three data points are kind of interesting throughout this, uh, this group of students. And so maybe one of the main takeaways at this stage, and again, this is just preliminary data, is that um, we also have this high impulse control happening. And that's one of our higher ones that's in the green over here. Um, so we've got this high impulse control happening with lower emotional expression, lower interpersonal relationships and lower self-regard. Um, so this might mean something like a student is talking themselves out of expressing or sharing ideas or even telling folks on campus that they do need help and, and reaching out when they need help. So those are the things we're kind of on the lookout for, for this preliminary data. Um, I wanna show the next one is just has an overlay. If I can get back to where I was. Cassandra, I think you bear, uh, muted yourself. How's that, better? Yes. Sorry, I don't know how I muted myself. Sarah, when did you last hear me? As you started this slide. This one, okay. So this preliminary data um, shows us our school lines first generation students then our, in our 25 student cohort compared to what I'll call all school of mine students. But um, it's not really all school of mine students. So I'll, I'll be careful in saying that. This is actually all of the EQI data that we have for school of mine students. And it's actually 160 students that have been collected over a number of years in the red data here. Um, and these are, various groups. So uh, it might be a specific class that we have measured. It might be um, leaders on campus. It might be a camp team or a group that wanted to do the EQI. And so it's just a, an aggregate data from, from 160 different student responses. So um, it may be representative of our campus and it may not. So we just have to be a little bit careful there. Um, but a couple things that I'll point out is that um, the EQI overall emotional intelligence is right about 100 for our, for our campus, whereas our um, first generation students are a little bit lower. And so the, the things that I pointed out before um, are kind of evident here as well, where we have this high impulse control for our first generation students. That's actually higher than our campus overall. Um, and still that low emotional expression, low interpersonal relationships, low self-regard, those things are, are certainly all still happening, happening um, on our campus. So this will be interesting to watch over the next few years um, and, and see where we can go and see where we can improve for these first generation students to help them succeed. So then um, the last piece here is the reinvest piece and this is the long-term sustainability of our program. Um, and so Dorothy had a good comment earlier, but there are ways in that we're asking for help uh, from all of you and the, the surrounding community, et cetera. Um, so the first thing is to just help us update a database. We only started collecting first generation status on, on our students recently. So for alumni, certainly um, we don't have that data and that would be a nice piece to have if we, if we need to reach out to a first generation student uh, for any reason, it would be nice to have that. So if you're willing, um, if you are a first generation student, reach out to either myself or Sarah and we can update that and put you on a list. Um, I would love it if, if you all would recommend outstanding students for this program. So we have the first cohort that started this fall. 
We are going to have another cohort start next fall, so fall of 2021. These would be um, seniors in high school now that would want to attend School of Mines in the fall. Um, so if you could recommend those outstanding students to the program that you know, that would be great. And I'll put a little plug in. We actually have free application for the School of Mines through November 30th. So they can apply to the School of Mines for next year for free. And then our SD First application for the scholarship um, put a little link on there. Um, I would also love uh, to have any alumni reach out and help mentor students, whether you're a first generation student or not. So these students can, can often use a little bit of extra nudge and the more voices, the better from a, a variety of different paths. So uh, if mentoring students sounds like inter of interest to you, let me know. Um, we're always looking for student workshops. So if you are interested in providing a workshop or being a speaker, um, those kind of things, or even helping out with one, let us know. Um, and then of course, giving to the program. So helping to fund our students um, and giving to that scholarship uh, piece would be very helpful as well. Um, so I put my contact information on there and, and Sarah's in case that you don't have it, I'm sure you do. And with that, let me ask if there are questions or thoughts from the panel. Yes, if you have any um, questions or comments, just please put them in the Q&A um, and we'll see them and I'll watch for them or the chat. So I'll watch for those also. Thank you, Dr. Larencott. Thanks for setting up. Thanks for everybody for attending and um, hopefully we can get the word out about this SD First program. And then um, while I'm waiting for questions or comments, um, as always, I always look for feedback um, on our, our lunch and learn. So please, I dropped the link in the chat. Um, but please, we appreciate your feedback. And then, um, and just a couple other shameless plugs for a couple upcoming events. Um, next Thursday, or sorry, November 4th, because this month is going by so fast. November 4th, Thursday, we are going to have a department update from the R uh, ROTC program. And then um, Tuesday, November, uh, November 9th at five o'clock, we have an alumni CEO one, Daniel Stanton. He'll be he will be presenting on the supply chain and what is going on right now in the world. Um, and then November 21st at 11 for our next Lunch and Learn, the physics department will be talking about their research that is going up, going on in the Sanford Underground. Um, so I will pop all that information in the chat. So we'd love to have you. Any questions or anything, um, please feel free to email us. Um, we love, we appreciate you being here. So. A pretty quiet group today. It sounds like it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone. And again, if you missed it or got in or caught on late, um, I will. Ha I will. This is being recorded, so I will upload it to the YouTube channel, and then I will um, get the link. And then um, I can also send the presentation slides if you're interested in getting those also. Yes, I'm happy to share those with you, Sarah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dorothy, yeah, that would be great if you could just email um, Dr. Barencott. She'll she'll see the email, and I'll put it in. Uh, it's on the slide, yeah, on the slide, yeah. Yes, I left it on this slide. So send me an email, Dorothy, and I'm happy to 